Hello everybody, welcome, very sincere welcome to the second MSNAP webinar around this lovely COVID-19 time. So today um, we're focusing on adaptive memory services and working flexibly during COVID-19. Some of you, this will probably be your first webinar, I'm guessing that some of you may have been on the webinar just a few weeks ago. So I just wanted to mention briefly, there was um, a lot of great ideas at that last one. I think people have been clearly adapting and changing their services with remarkable creativity and speed in terms of everything going on. Um, there were lots of requests to join email lists in terms of working with CST, working with how to assess, working with neuropsychology. I'm sure many people have joined those and I'm sure those lists have been active in the last few weeks. So um, we'll pick up on some of those things as we go along, but we're, we're very lucky to have three new speakers today. Um, so basically we can sort of see how things have moved and how things are going. Uh, if we just go on, if we go through some housekeeping points. Do I have to move it? Apologies. <laughs> no, thank you very much. OK, so it's all right there, nice and clear for you. It's a live event, so unless you're a designated speaker, you, you'll be on mute. It, it's different to other teams meetings, but you have got wonderful question part down the side of your screen. Please do use the question and I answer function to ask any questions um, and again to vote for the ones you want answered. If you're speaking on one of these webinars it, it's very focused, it's quite intense, it's pretty hard to keep an eye on the questions as well so that's kind of my job as chair and the other um, colleagues at MSNAP will be keeping an eye too but I'll be trying to keep a, a good eye on the questions looking at the ones that people are most keen to be answered so I'll then help the speakers direct them to the questions which people most want answered at the end of their talks. So I hope that's sort of quite clear and quite simple. Um, this will be recorded. The link will be shared after the event via MSNAP, so you'll be able to look at it or, or um, point other people to where to see it. Uh, and also I'll, I'll bring it back to this at the end again, but if you have got any requests or suggestions for future webinars, please do let us know. Um, the last one was really well attended. I can't remember the exact number, it was well over 200 people. It was, it was quite something with a very active chat going on down the side and lots of really good ideas and suggestions and additions via, via the audience. So um, we're hoping that we will have more. I think there's a provisional one planned for the end of June around neuropsychology. I'll, I'll come back at the end to, to some other ideas, perhaps around having speakers of people living with dementia, perhaps more focus on supporting carers. There's lots of ideas, but really we want to be able to offer webinars which are meeting what you're focused on at the moment, because I know everybody's moving quite a pace. So if we can tailor them to, to what people need most um, as the weeks go through, we aim to do that. So that's all I've got to say for now. We've got three speakers uh, today for us. Excuse me, I've got my notes on my phone. We've got Dr Chris Yeager, a consultant in old age psychiatry from the Isle of Man, speaking first. Then Dr Sabrina Lee Hunt and Margaret Cooper from T. Esquire Valley's NHS Trust. I'll, I'll again introduce people more as they come on. And Dr Sanfana Krishnan from, uh, I'm not quite sure, from where, director from MHSAP Trust. So basically, first I'd like to hand over to Dr. Chris Yegas um, to present our first speech. Thank you. Thank you. Um, hello. Good afternoon. Um, I, um, welcome to this webinar. Um, I've been um, asked to um, just present to you a little bit about what's been happening here in the Isle of Man with memory services as a result of the uh, current um, COVID situation. Um, I probably need to give you some background uh, to the Isle of Man because it is probably different here than what you're experiencing over there. The Isle of Man, just just for those of you who don't know, um, is not the Isle of Wight. Easy mistake to make. We had somebody applying for a job recently who thought they were applying to the Isle of Wight. Um, it's, it's, uh, we're geographically situated sitting in the Irish Sea approximately equidistant from England, Scotland and Ireland. And uh, again, if you don't know, we aren't part of the UK, therefore we aren't part of the NHS. We have, um, we're a self-governing uh, Crown dependency, much like the Channel Islands. Um, so our decision making around COVID is really based through our own Department of Health and Social Care, who are essentially our health service, uh, rather than edicts and um, regulations that come from good old Boris. Uh, we have nothing to do with Boris here, which is rather nice, to be honest. Um, 
<laughs> so um, we're in an interesting position as a service in that we have had to respond to what is potentially a very small and close knit community, potentially having a very significant impact from what could have happened with coronavirus if all the predictions for were correct if we hadn't had any sort of lockdown. Um, the island has closed its borders and we've had a fairly um, strict lockdown, a little bit in the style of New Zealand with, with very high numbers of testing uh, per head of population. At one point we were ninth in the world for the number of tests we'd done per million population. So we've, we've covered a lot of uh, the population. We've got a very robust testing, tracking and tracing uh, ability now. And as of this morning, we have finally got rid of um, officially our last coronavirus case. So we are now, um, we've had 336 and we've ha had any for 14 days and we've been declared not COVID free yet, but our last case today, which is a rather nice position to be in. We are very isolated here now because the borders are closed. So people can travel off the island, but you won't get in unless you're given a sort of certificate by the government to say you're an essential key worker. So that's the position we're in here. Um, our service, uh, again, just a bit of background to the service, we aren't a standalone memory clinic. So our service has had to adapt very much as a generic old age psychiatry service. So all the memory services plus everything else the health, mental health service do for older people, including inpatient services, liaison, has had to adapt as a whole to, to what's been happening. Um, which meant we had to make some fairly significant decisions early on as to what we do with what were deemed, I suppose, elective services or non-urgent, non-crisis services, which meant actually from the beginning in mid-March, we actually cancelled all our memory clinics. So we've, we're now having to adapt to a situation where nobody has been assessed and seen for diagnosis um, since the middle of March, uh, which now presents us with a challenge. What we found as a team is that the time that probably would have been filled with memory services has significantly ballooned uh, from the impact of lockdown on the rest of our elderly caseload um, in terms of particularly those people with affective disorders. Uh, we've had increased problems with mood disorders. We've had increased problems with suicidality, um, overdoses and much more in the way of the sort of I suppose the functional side um, and plus also those people who have been isolating here uh, with dementia um, possibly with carers or with care agencies going in have also had a significant impact because of the availability of care which has been reduced and also the difficulties in coping in a lockdown isolated situation on your own if you're a carer with dementia so our team has really had to step up in terms of managing risk from a distance and this has been one of the biggest challenges. So we've had challenges during this. We're going to be left with challenges now because we've developed a significant backlog now in terms of our memory service of that part of the service. The problem with our service is we run a consultant led diagnosis service. Um, currently the bottleneck in that is me in terms of the number of cases I can see. Um, we're also a consultant down, so I'm currently managing two caseloads. So the, the waiting list had already gone up um, and is now, I don't know, is going to be many months. We have for many years uh, met the wonderful MSNAP standard of diagnosis within 12 weeks from referral to diagnosis and it's way outside that now. So, so our next challenge is to look at how we perhaps modify our practice now to try and claw back some of that backlog and provide people with the service that they haven't been getting for the last um, for the last few weeks. In terms of adapting to what's gone on, in, the team have, we've got a quite a large uh, community team who um, cover the whole island um, and they've really stepped up to the mark in terms of of, of actually managing the, the change in caseload. I think it's been difficult for everybody and I'm sure you'll all agree in the UK that's absolutely no different. Um, we've, we've got the advantage here of having um, uh, some uh, peripheral hubs in different parts of the island. So some of the team have decanted out to those areas so they can sort of work 
in a team setting, but remotely, which has allowed which has allowed social distancing appropriately. Um, many staff have been now able to work from home. Good old Microsoft Teams, when it works, um, has been invaluable in in having meetings. But most of our contacts with patients have been telephone contact. Um, this has raised concerns from all of us in terms of things like risk management um, because it's difficult, isn't it? I'm sure we'll all agree to adequately assess patients when you can't see them face to face, when you're not able to spend time with them or with their families. Um, and, and I think this has been a significant challenge. And I think what we're finding now is the longer this has gone on, because our, our lockdown is still in place, it's just been significantly reduced over the last few weeks. Uh, I actually went to a pub on Monday, which, which, is, which is a first. We had to sit outside, but we could actually go to a pub, which um, that's not particularly relevant, but I'm just trying to make you feel a bit jealous. Um, but, the, but obviously our advice to vulnerable populations is that they're still isolating and still shielding, and we're still having to work with that. And the longer it's gone on, the more impact it's having. So we're having far more urgent requests for contact coming through from patients and relatives. And, and a lot of those initially were around, as I mentioned, people struggling from the mood point of view and the anxiety point of view of isolation and the social isolation. But just recently, again, I think carers now for people with dementia particularly are starting to struggle as well with some of the behavioural changes they're seeing as a result. And I'm sure this is echoed across everybody's uh, practice elsewhere. Um, we uh, now need, I think, to look at how we move forward. And I know I've actually, I actually did put a query on the uh, memory chat, the MSTAP memory chat recently, and I did have quite a lot of responses about modifying our practice now to look at nurse led um, assessment and diagnosis. Um, this is something that I know is done in clinics elsewhere. And, you know, as an MSNAP reviewer, I've come into contact with many clinics that do uh, nurse led services. So what we're looking to do initially, just in terms of planning, is possibly just as we start to get back to uh, business as usual, which we are now starting to do. Initially, we may need to just see some of our backlog as we have before with me providing the clinic diagnosis and the assessments. Um, but then maybe in the next few weeks look towards working with the wider CMHT um, for older people to look at modifying their practice so that they can deliver the diagnosis. So a model we have in mind, which I think is, is echoed elsewhere, is for much of the actual diagnostic process to be done in consultation with myself, with the CMHP who's carrying out all the assessments, with the newer imaging, etc., to arrive at a diagnosis and plan. And then that's taken back by the CMHP, who would normally have been involved anyway for post-diagnostic support to actually take out, deliver the diagnosis and work with families and, and carers from there. Um, obviously in complex cases, we feel they, they probably still would need uh, a medical uh, involvement with that. Um, and this is a model that, that we're now looking at, really that would significantly increase, increase our throughput. Um, and again, I'm sure there'll be feedback later on from maybe other um, attendees at the webinar or, or even the speakers of, of some of the anxieties that, that the team may have in adapting to that model um, and what's maybe needed in terms of training on increased knowledge and education for them to uh, be in a position to sort of deliver, deliver a diagnosis confidently and in an appropriate manner. I'm pretty certain they could all do it perfectly well, but I think there are anxieties there understandably because this you know it's a significant change to the model so i think ultimately we've we've coped but i think we've had to cope with because we're not a standalone memory service unfortunately we've had to manage by almost shelving the memory service part of our service to to deal with the the, the wider um issues of older people with mental health problems which have been significant all our workloads are significantly greater i'm beginning to wonder how how we actually find time to do anything before um so essentially i think that's in a nutshell how things have been working here so i'm happy now if anybody's got any any questions or even any suggestions really just for us as how how we might move forward now and and start to to, to work through our our backlog um yeah so over to you
Stunning <laughs> silence. <laughs> Hi. Just waiting until I came back on live. Thank you so much, Chris. And, and there's there's a comment here which echoes many, I'm sure, about definitely some jealousy around that. So I don't know if that's about Boris or the pubs or um, <laughs> no Pub COVID, probably we'll see. <laughs> so, <laughs> but it's, it's good to hear. And, and I think it sort of echoes as well very much of the thoughts about how much you've had to focus on issues around general mental health um, and supporting carers like, while you've been closed for referrals. So um, there's one specific question that's come up. It says the, the Isle of if I read this right, the Isle of Man has a population of around 85,000. Can you yeah. confirm the size of the elderly population? Is it around 17,000? Somewhere 000? around seven, 18, probably. 17, 18,000. Um, and sometimes it feels, 17 to 18,000, sometimes it feels like we've got all of them. But, <laughs> but yes, it, yeah, so that's that's roughly what we're, what we're dealing with in terms of catchment. Okay, thank you. I don't know if anyone has a follow up comment to that, but thanks for confirming that. Um, the, the next question that's come up is, is how are you defining more complex cases, i.e. the ones that you'd want to assess yourself rather than through CMHP? I, I, I think that's that's an interesting question because we've only, so I'm waiting until I'm live, sorry. That's an interesting question. And actually we've only had very preliminary discussions about whether we can move over to a, um, a sort of nursing led diagnosis service. And I suppose that ironing out what constitutes more complex is something that will have to be built into some sort of pathway. I think a lot of that decision, obviously because there'll be detailed multidisciplinary discussion about each case as it comes through, involving the CMHP, involving occupational therapists, involving whatever other information we have, and a decision can be made at that stage, I suppose, about who it would be deemed more appropriate perhaps to see myself rather than just uh, having the diagnosis delivered by and the management plan delivered by the nurse. I suppose also after the diagnosis is given um, and treatment or management is initiated, again, that might generate a process where patients and families actually feel that they do need to see maybe a consultant and that that, that could then be facilitated. So I suppose, again, that probably is something that we need to iron out as a service. I mean, if anyone's any suggestions, that would be very helpful, um, but it would obviously need to be included in some sort of some sort of pathway um, in, in the near future, the very near future. I think this has become a bit of a priority for us. So as we are just about now being told that we can start to look to go back to business as usual, I think this is the time that we need to now really start pinning down how we're going to do this. Thank you. There's a couple. There's a couple more questions come up as well. Uh, the, the one with the most thumbs up next to it is a question about how you're completing neuropsychology assessments remotely. So I might have missed it. Are you doing the assessments remotely? The other question is, did you consider running any of your clinic virtually? So I don't know which you want to take first. There's one, one about virtual clinics and one about neuropsychs remotely, if that's how you're doing it. I can do both of those together. So there was consideration for how we uh, worked. We're aware that um, the actual ability to do these sort of do our interactions with our patients and assessments remotely would be very limited in terms of our sort of infrastructure and how we could do that. And again, in terms of priorities, it's been very clear that the wider mental health issues have have significantly filled the time and resources of the mental health service. So looking back, the decision to sort of shelf the, um, the routine, it's awful to think of dementia assessment and diagnosis as routine, isn't it? But I think we had to prioritise, um, you know, um, because, we're, because we're such a wide ranging service uh, delivering to, well, a whole country, essentially. Um, I think that, so we haven't been doing remote um, assessments. I don't think it actually would have been possible. Um, it, I mean, to me, it, again, I know other people, places have been doing this. It just, I, I think the logistics are probably very difficult, but I'm sure other speakers may be able to uh, tell us that. In terms of neuropsychology, we're very limited in that we did have a neuropsychologist. Um, well, we have technically got a neuropsychologist, but he shared his time between here and Birmingham and our, our borders are closed. So if he was going to 
flip between the two. Every time he came here, we'd have to self-isolate for two weeks if he was even allowed in. So unfortunately, uh, we don't have neuropsychology input at the moment. So again, that's something else that currently isn't possible. Um, so this is something else we have to look to in the next. Well, I suppose it's all rather dependent on what now happens with coronavirus and with our borders and with how we, the DHSC here, our health service, um, gear back up to, to business as usual. So the next few weeks, I think, are going to be crucial in this. Thanks, Chris. So there are just a couple of other follow ups. I think you've probably answered most of it. So um, you're not doing it remotely so that, that that's kind of sorted. And, and if you had a psychologist, although actually these days, given that that's starting to happen remotely, you might be able to even if they're in Birmingham. So it might be. A <laughs> who knows? Um, just one other question really that I don't think has been answered is um, somebody says they're interested in the number of active patients for the team and the skill mix. They're working similarly to yourselves, not a standalone memory team. Um, and they're again thinking about delivering diagnosis. So I, th I think they're just sort of interested in what you're doing and, and, and what you've said. So um, that's a thumbs up to that. And just the one other one is in Leicestershire, they're looking at digital platforms to assess those who've had scans but not been assessed. Wondering if you've done any work in that area, people who have had scans but not been assessed otherwise, and how you've managed issues about information governance. Uh, yeah. I'll wait till I'm live. Yeah. Um, yeah, it doesn't say I'm live. I'm just waiting to. It doesn't say you're live, not just yet. <laughs> right, sorry, just the first question. You'll have to go back, sorry. What was the first question again? About, about caseload and skills mix. Yeah, but I think in some ways that was just echoing um, do, doing similar work to you and appreciating hearing oh, us about it. Right. So uh, I, I understand that right. Um, yes, so the question was looking at kind of um, an issue about those who've had scans not been assessed. Um, so just how, it's, a, it's a question if I've got this right about how you manage issues around information governance. Um, I'm not um, Is there a can we have some clarification in terms of what specifically in terms of information governance just to give me a clue no for sure so i mean perhaps, perhaps you can make if uh yes i might be being a bit dense i'm not fully clear on that so um i think it's really asking if you've done some work on digital platforms with scans um yes Stuart, if, if i'm not quite sure what information governance issues you were concerned about if, if you could clarify we might be able to answer sorry if we're being slow on this but that'd be helpful thank you um i'm aware there are some more questions um, it's, it's great that the questions are starting to come through. I'm wondering in terms of time, if we should move into the next speaker, I'll keep an eye on the questions and perhaps any that we don't manage to quite answer, um, we will try and answer afterwards. Is that OK? Yeah. Yeah. I say in that case, I really thank you so much, Chris. Glad you got on to join us. Um, we are, we remain jealous and it's, it's really interesting to hear about how your service is working. It varies so much from place to place. So thank you ever so much. Um, we'll move on to our next speakers who are Dr. Sabrina Lee Hunt, consultant psychiatrist and Margaret Cooper, who's the memory service nurse prescriber. And they're from Tees, Esk and Weir Valleys. So if I can hand over to hear from them. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. Can we have the first slide, please? That's it coming. And the second slide, please. So we just wanted to share what we're doing at our service. Um, as a said, team, we felt from the very beginning that not doing assessments wasn't an option. And very early on, you know, we weighed the pros and cons on, you know, doing this. At the same time, we were debating um, a working group uh, was established by our directorate. And uh, they, you know, it was discussed the pros and cons of conducting assessments and delivery over the, you know, uh, remotely. So I think the, through the webinars, we all share the same worries in relation to, you know, um, to the risks um, of not doing face-to-face -face appointments. Um, so just, I think it's flipped into the next slide. This is what we did. Oh, they're all going. Can we go back? I think the slides are gone. Yes. So 
the first thing that we did, we changed from the one-stop um, shop floating consultant model that we had to adapt to COVID and we followed our trust guidelines. We sort of kitted ourselves very quickly in terms of IT equipment, software, you know, headphones, laptops for people to work remotely, mobile phones and the etc. And that meant that staff could work from home and some at base. Yes, and ensuring that the social distancing was possible. Um, this also allowed our daily huddles uh, via Microsoft meetings. We also, at the same time, we were reviewing the trust dementia care pathway and added modifications to support the continued delivery of our assessments and treatment. Can I have the next slide, please? So, take it, having you know addressed all those basics, what we did was. Prior to any appointment, there has been a lot of work from our team uh, to ensure that patients that were screened, that they could uh, participate either by attend anywhere or telephone assessment. Uh, we have obtained consent uh, to be able to, you know, uh, to talk to carers and relatives, and this has streamlined the assessment. So what happened was at the time of the assessment, we knew that we could speak to everybody. So it wasn't that we were calling and then there was, you know, there was, uh, we weren't able to conduct assessment. So, and um, also with staff calling before, uh, a few days before. Hello, I'm here. There's also at the same time, there's information sent uh, about our service and third sector uh, via post, including any services that had been set up in the area in response to COVID-19. Can I have the next slide, please? So in terms of the assessment, um, we've organized ourselves in that first we embraced the live recording. The day of the assessment, we had the slot for the assessment per se, followed by the MDT discussion with myself. So the, the, all the assessments are undertaken by the nursing staff and my GP registrar. And this is followed by a half an hour discussion uh, where we discuss the results of, you know, the assessment, the informal history, um, the, the bloods and CTs, um, relevant physical history and information that um, provided by the GP is ready for discussion. In terms of the assessment tools, we felt that as a team, uh, we were more comfortable using aspects of the ACE3, but you know how things are moving so quickly. This slide is all news because we already have set up a meeting this Thursday to discuss remote assessments with our neuropsychologist, Dr. Fullen. And um, so once we have this MDT discussion, we, if we're able to uh, deliver a working diagnosis, we go ahead if there are things that we need to, you know, to check with uh, primary care, other, specia uh, other specialties we do. Um, if we feel it needs to refer to neuropsychology, we discuss it with Dr. Fullen as well. Um, it's also, ha if, for example, we, we have really good links uh, in the area with South Tees, uh, with our neurologists and us working remotely and them working remotely, it has um, some some of the queries I, I had in the past, and this is personal experience, is that the, any concerns, the replies come quicker. So they have been most helpful, same with cardiology. And um, so, so we have that, we generate, um, we agree a diagnosis, and then we decide as a, you know, between the assessor and myself, um, and having the patient at the center, obviously, whether we're, who is going to give that feedback? And the senior clinicians, I think, I don't know if Margaret is on live at the moment. Sorry, I think this has been. Yes, I am I'm, here. I'm, okay, I'm going, to pass, I'm going to pass on to Margaret, who's going to take over the diagnostic feedback. Okay, so um, We've, we've worked out a system of um, giving diagnostic feedback um, with the nurses. Now, it's something that the nurses in this team always did when there was no one else available um, and it was in the patient's best interest. And so um, that became 
more a part of the nurses um, role in the autumn last year. So um, the senior nurses were regularly, um, it was disclosing the diagnosis and giving diagnostic support. Um, and so when, when it started with uh, the remote working with COVID, um, we, we adapted that situation to, um, to, to, to give the diagnosis over the phone where appropriate, where appropriate support was, was available and with the patient's consent at all times. In fact, we consent the patient to hearing their diagnosis at the start of the assessment and then again um, when we, we phone um, at the end of the phone call and then again when we phone to give the, the feedback. And it is, it is interesting that most patients do want to hear what the outcome of their assessment is. Um, and most patients want to talk about what treatment options there are and what therapies there are. Um, it's, it's always a senior nurse and we're very lucky in this team to have nurses who've worked in the field for a long time. Um, we will organise to have a family member present if possible, or if, um, if the patient's in a care setting, such as a care home or a, um, a sheltered housing, we'll arrange to, to, to um, do the uh, feedback when the patient is with a carer, um, and also to um, contact a family member to be available to speak with the patient straight afterwards, um, and they can phone us back at any point. Um, and so uh, from a clinician's point of view, it feels quite therapeutic to be able to report back quickly um, the outcome of the assessment that you've been doing. And we're not making as many definite decisions by any means during this time. We're, we're being quite cautious and giving, um, giving feedback on where we think they are. We're um, um, uncovering risks and dealing with those as well. Um, now, I can't see what you're looking at because my technology is not working. So are we on the um, slide uh, that says commencing treatment? Yes, we are yeah. now. Good. OK, so um, uh, we have several non-medical prescribers, nurses in this team, and um, the, the discussion about whether the patient would be suitable for um, medication for their memory is, is done at the point of, of diagnostic discussion with the consultant. Um, and based on that and um, information we have about their physical well-being, now we have to, had to be quite creative about finding out about blood pressures, pulses and um, previous ECGs. And we've got to know our primary care colleagues quite well, the nurses um, in, the, in the surgeries. And they're very helpful in getting the right information. We're prescribing it very cautiously, giving, um, giving the lower dose for much longer and only ever increasing it where clinical need is evident. Um, and that means that the risks of not increasing it are greater than the risks of increasing it. And we've had a, a, a larger number of patients who don't want to start treatment while they are isolating um, because of the risk of side effects who are put in for appointments in the future so that that can be reviewed. Um, and obviously um, working with pharmacies to ensure that the, the prescription is being delivered. Um, and then review appointments. And I think we've been doing more review appointments than ever before. Um, we will ring people within two weeks of starting any medication and we will have a more extensive phone call appointment um, within six weeks. Um, and. Uh, Throughout all of this, the, the prescribing nurses are having regular supervision with our consultants, with Sabrina, and um, so that we're, we're talking about the, um, the changes that we're having to make in prescribing practice, and we're talking about any, any concerns that we might have um, quickly. If the concern is of a, an individual patient, we will contact Sabrina very straight away. We don't wait. Um, and with that, we have had some good results. Patients seem to be pleased that we can at least start things, especially those who've got higher um, needs with regard to risk. Um, and when the next slide is following diagnosis, if, if that could go up, please. Um, we have several very good 
OTs and um, one of the senior OTs has been doing a session we call Living Well with Memory Loss, which is offered to all people with a new diagnosis. Now, that was a group, but obviously it's not a group anymore. Um, so we, um, we are, well, our occupational therapist is doing it on a one-by-one -one basis um, at the moment and sending out inf information by post to family members and to the patient. Um, and this is in addition to the um, information that we always send out for anybody newly diagnosed. Um, but there are some, you know, breaking news is that we are looking to use uh, Microsoft Teams for the group work so that um, groups of, of carers and patients can meet on screen. And this has actually opened up ideas about um, relatives who live far away or even abroad being able to join in with that educational session, um, which is actually something new, which we haven't been able to do before. Um, and the other thing is cognitive stimulation therapy um, in the same sort of vein. At the moment, um, our, um, our healthcare assistant who runs this is, is sending out individualized activity um, uh, uh, sort of bag packages to, to the patients after having spoken to them about what their interests are and, and that kind of thing. But we are looking to whether we can do something electronically online. Obviously, all of this is only available to people who are able to speak on the phone or to access um, online um, services like I haven't been able to do today. Um, but, uh, you know, it, 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 it seemed to us that it was better to do something rather than not, not keep going. And we had the staff available to keep going in the best way we saw. And it has been welcomed, as far as we can see, by patients. Um, so it's generally been quite positive um, and I think as well as good for the patients, it's been good for staff morale to keep going. Um, we've been able to check for risks and um, refer on to other services as appropriate and we've made several community team referrals during this time. We've been referring a lot to our um, um, uh, third sector Dementia Forward uh, uh, organisation who I know have been doing a lot of support work with our patients and carers and so on the whole um, uh, the, the reflections that I'm, I'm up to the staff reflections um, slide now I don't know if we might have to skip over the feedback um, but that was from one of our of my colleagues who had listened in to a uh, diagnostic feedback and uh, she felt that this was a, a, a very positive experience for the patient and that um, there was a, a holistic effect in doing everything in the one day or over several days in the same week so that the patient had, had a, a feeling of, of um, some kind of um, conclusion being reached to work forward to support them in the future. Um, and we, we're very aware that delaying um, patient response to referrals can cause a, a, as much risk as, as not as doing them remotely. So we wanted to see if we could do as much as we could remotely um, and um, without compromising safety, maintaining standards as much as we can. And we, we do recognise there are limits and we are very aware that going forward, we are probably going to have to adapt our service long term as well. Um, but ideally, we want to be back seeing patients face to face. And for all these patients who have received diagnosis like this, we want them to have that opportunity of face-to-face -face confirmation of that diagnosis and review at some point in the future. I think that's back to Sabrina now. Yes, can we have a listen next slide, please? Just wanted to have a word about the role of clinical psychology. As yet, we haven't been able to complete any new assessment or repeat neuropsychometry. However, for those patients that we have assessed, we continue to provide their joint diagnostic feedback by Attend Anywhere with myself and Dr. Fullen. And that has been very well received by our patients. Um, our clinical psychologist uh, is very active and uh, fundamental in our clinical leadership sessions, which is maintained weekly. And also she has been present throughout lockdown to support us as needed uh, and assisting with other roles, um, you know, outside the memory service. 
I continue just to add, I just continue to deliver diagnosis when um, there are more complex patients or if it's patient preference. So I am available. Um, can we pass to the next slide, please? I think um, Margaret has addressed some of the constraints and challenges. And um, we are very, as Margaret said earlier on, we are very cautious about uh, titration. Um, we are very mindful of the risks and we continue to address that. Um, and also, you know, some of the, the challenges around those who require neurology opinion, especially our younger patients. Uh, thankfully, we have an excellent working relationship with our colleagues in South Tees. Can I have the next slide, please? And well, the positives, I think the most important thing is that patients continue to be assessed and many are receiving a working diagnosis, how we have been able to adapt uh, and continue to put our patients at the center of everything that we do. Um, that us as a team, we feel less isolated uh, when working at home and the communication that we have through our daily huddles. And we continue, all of us, you know, that are working either at base or at home, being involved in operational decisions and how we have embraced technology. And I would say me, <laughs> you know, myself, you know, I found it quite easy, uh, especially with um, the use of Attend Anywhere. Can I have the next slide, please? I just want to say a big thank you for all my team and Sharon Airy, who has been so supportive uh, throughout this time, our clinical director, Dr. Mutukrishnan, and Dr. Mani Krishnan, who's our senior clinical director in Tube, who is going to be our next speaker. Thank you. Sarah, just on mute. I didn't know I could do that. Sorry, I'm back. I was muted accidentally. So um, thank you so much. I, I'm very mindful of time that the lot, the most comments here were around um, neuropsych assessment, which you've answered because that's on hold at the moment, and also asking for clarification about assessments tools. Um, but maybe we'll come on to that if, if Krishna is from your service as well. Can I just ask previous speakers if you're able to have a quick look at the comments? Don't worry if you can't right now. And um, perhaps if there's any that you can easily answer in the replies, please do. Otherwise, we'll seek to answer these later on. Um, just to say quickly as well before I hand over, I've had a really comprehensive email from Amy Spector about access to CST events. So I'll just pop details of that up here as well so people have those. But for now, um, if I can hand over, please. Thank you very much to Dr. Santana Krishnan and over to you. Yep. Hi, good afternoon. Uh, thanks, Sabrina. So you, you have saved half my lecture because we are from the same trust. So um, I'll try to summarize uh, some of the things uh, what uh, what went through. Um, uh, Chris, uh, you set the scene up about how you mentioned about uh, literally the memory services were stopped. And uh, I heard from a colleague from London as well that because the staff had redeployed for COVID work that they had to stop the memory clinic. In fact, now they are worried that whether they'll be allowed to start the memory clinic because uh, the managers th are thinking, is there a need to restart at all? So just watch the space. Don't stop the service so that you have a risk of losing it. Next slide, please. So when when the lockdown happened, I think if I remember it was 23rd or 24th of March, uh, the first thing as a senior clinical director, some of the things I was worried are, um, uh, people are asking, starting to send emails, is it business as usual? Have we stopped the business? Like everybody who had the dilemma. And then um, we took some basic uh, kind of concepts. We used a need and a risk as a clear mantra in any of our mental health, community mental health work, let it be functional or organic. What was the need and what is the risk of either doing something or not doing something else? So that was a key basis. And the second thing is we did have some concerns. I think there were questions popping uh, from uh, on the question side about, uh, I think it was Angela uh, who asked about Angela Smith. How do you deal with staff emotions of half-hearted assessment and 
discharging them back so that the patients, uh, you know, you feel incomplete. The patients might feel incomplete. So just be mindful that one thing we we never did was we never stopped any referrals, but we definitely never discharge them back just because we are closed. So uh, majority of our memory services continue to run. Uh, I don't know whether other CMHTs have done. We used RAG rating, red, amber, green. So patients were constantly reviewed by the uh, care, uh, you know, care, care coordinator so that if there is a change in the risk and need, we intervened. So uh, and the other point to mention in our dilemma is there were again some strong opposition from senior clinicians asking about um, why are we doing it uh, like sarah mentioned uh, is it an essential service of course it's essential so imagine somebody already for uh, you know 18 months to a year having a memory problem they had the courage to start making themselves available for assessment and then we telling we're going to be another six or eight months that we won't be seeing you and they are already on a lockdown they're on shielding or isolating it's a very scary time so we went back to patients and uh, families and uh, we thought that they will say okay then leave it that way but 85 percent of the patients and families came back and said if you are going to do any other way just do it we'll be happy to engage uh, so that was a key kind of a driver for us to carry on doing things in a slightly in you know, an adapted way uh, next slide please yeah so uh, what we did we started again sabrina alluded to uh, venkat one of our clinical directors he led a group and these are the things questions we put shall we look at enhanced screening i think uh, 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 Kumar asked, how did the triage decision was uh, uh, made? So we did a bigger triage, uh, not just like, you know, where do you live? What's your telephone number? We asked lots of need and risk based questions. And then we also had significant discussions with the family. And then even at every step of the way, we uh, kind of weighed between what is the assessment remote versus face to face. I think uh, uh, Teresa asked the questions, is anybody doing face to face? Of course we are doing face to face, not on every patient, but if there is a patient, as you mentioned, Teresa, if there is a severe hearing impairment. Uh, in fact, today I was talking to one of my CPNs. We have a patient who is uh, uh, who can't speak or hear and he and he doesn't do sign language as well but he's exceptionally good at text so our cpns have been keeping in touch with text and then now we have decided to meet him in the park outside the house to have a chat you know have a discussion so every step of the way we are considering case by case and if there is a face to face with ppe is an appropriate thing we continue to do it throughout the uh, period in the last eight weeks and again diagnosis we talk about remote remote and face to face um, again as an example uh, i have reviewed in the last two weeks 20 patients who on an initial kind of an admin telephone call said because we've got all the investigation they're waiting for a diagnostic appointment the family said uh, my father or mother is shielding we are far away we don't want anything happening until you are able to do face to face and when we reviewed the 23 of them with the adam bruce score of below 50 and two of them are driving so you can see the family might have said don't don't want any diagnosis so already i have spoken to the family and as soon as i highlighted that oh last week i've made my father to stop the driving because i was starting to get worried so you can see the information coming so by pigeonholing them not suitable for face to face or not not willing for face to face is not good it goes back to the risk and the need and that's what we have been doing and uh, sabrina mentioned we are continuing to provide some ot assessment through telephone but we have not yet done a full blown uh, OT assessment uh, in the house. Next slide, please. So uh, when Venkat started his uh, kind of a group work to review our memory clinic pathway, we grouped them into three major categories, uh, screening, assessment, diagnosis and post diagnosis. Scre Next slide, please. Screening again became quite an enhanced screening, a thorough well informed history. Most of the clinician, all of us know that 
that's the key in our majority of our clinical diagnosis. History is the key. Uh, the next uh, bit in this uh, one, you may not be very clear, but just to say uh, one of our psychologists uh, kind of put this little word document to enhance our clinical history by looking at what are the history you need to take with regard to memory, attention, language, visual spatial and various things. So we were able to get more enhanced history and then people are aware of IQ code, which is a kind of a uh, family uh, questionnaire, which is again quite useful. So by doing those enhanced level of history, you are already kind of halfway through with regard to supporting your diagnosis. Next assessment. Next slide, please. Uh, and then assessment uh, again, uh, uh, I think uh, Kedar has put like a remote ACE on the uh, on your chat. So we started Again, we didn't think of one thing. We talked about blind mocha. We talked about somebody talked about components of ACE. I think uh, uh, my last slide would say if we were to follow one protocol, we will be stuck. Again, the history provided us some support. In fact, today uh, we were talking about somebody with a possible frontal lobe uh, uh, dementia. And then I was speaking to our psychologist and say, could you do bits and pieces of frontal lobe battery over telephone. So sometimes you may not be perfectly able to do a complete neuropsych, but there may be things you will be able to do that would aid you. And the other one, our one of our difficult uh, patients and families uh, who are not accepting a dementia diagnosis uh, and he was refusing to do uh, Adam Brooks even with PPE and our occupational therapist was very comfortably was able to do locals and uh, he was uh, he's, he scored 3.2 quite a poor locals and then while she was there she was able to do a quick kind of a kitchen assessment of making a cup of tea and uh, uh, putting some butter on a toast and there was a very clear evidence of significant impairment functionally. So that aided us to uh, look at that. And in fact, we are thinking about whether we need to look at some disposable locals uh, kind of a leather so that in this COVID time, whether we'll be able to do that. And the other thing with regard to neuroimaging, I think uh, around beginning of April, our nearest uh, acute hospital said will be closed for routine CT scans. But incidentally, last week they have they've started accepting referrals for CT scan. And we need to be mindful that not necessarily all, this, all the patients would need neuroimaging. I think I was on a, another webinar where people asked, what are you doing if you're not going to do a scan, if you're not going to check pulse? Uh, and there are ways we can do uh, various assessments. It's not a mutually exclusive thing. I see it as a jigsaw puzzle. As long as you're able to fit some of the pieces, one piece sometimes doesn't really matter. And then while we are doing assessment remotely, we may be able to look at dep depression and anxiety assessment so that if there are comorbid conditions that could be assessed and treated. Next slide, please. And uh, pulse and ECG again, that was been a question. So what what we need to be looking at is uh, if uh, again somebody asked the question, are the GPs are supportive about cautious prescribing? Not only cautious prescribing, even if you are going to initiate medication, these patients might be on the GP register with have had an ECG only like few months ago or have had had their pulse recorded. So we are able to get some summary care record and we are able to use that uh, to uh, uh, look at how we can initiate medication and also titration. And again, some of the patients who are going into a moderate diagnosis, even at the beginning, we've, we were able to start them on the mantine uh, without going through other, um, uh, you know, ECG and various things and don't don't forget other treatment options with regard to coma, dip, coma with depression and uh, anxiety. And again, uh, Margaret mentioned already that we may be able to do some of the CST and care support through remote uh, 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 technology. Next slide, please. Yeah, so brain scanning, uh, there is a, the slide deck will probably be uploaded at some point. Uh, the London, uh, uh, 
clinical network and put a quite a Jeremy Isaacson group have put a nice uh, PDF document on uh, the use and uh, the need of e uh, CT scan, which is a very good document for us to use. Uh, and also again, blood tests uh, you, from summary care record, you may be able to access uh, uh, some of the blood, blood investigation. Next slide, please. So I, I just for example, I thought I'll put a couple of CT scans which may be familiar to clinicians. Sometimes I feel like uh, this is my frustration. I could cut and paste a CT report because there's then generally a generalized age related involutional change with some deep periventricular ischemic changes and then the important bit we want about the temporal lobe or a specific lobar atrophy is generally missing and again in but in this case if you remember uh, if you think of that on the right hand side in the report they have mentioned medial temporal lobe atrophy and there is a hippocampal atrophy but in the conclusion there was absolutely no mention of medial temporal atrophy so you can see there are limitations about CT scanning as well as CT reporting so be mindful of that and I would you know my wish will be to get PAX access for all the memory clinics so that we will be able to look at the imaging and uh, I reviewed an image recently where it was put as no bleed, no stroke, age related changes and the patient had significant moderate medial temporal atrophy uh, and uh, uh, with a with a A score of 42. So it is about uh, you know how we are able to enhance our CT to subtype rather than just believing in the report is important. Next slide. So just to summarize, uh, this is what I started when I when I had some cynical questions on whether we need to continue our memory clinic or not, uh, because they say we can't do an ACE, we can't do this remotely. And then again, there was a question about uh, uh, what do you do if, if there is a uh, remote virtual video conference doesn't work. So one of the diagnostic appointments, I went on the video conferencing so that they know who I am. And then we had an introduction all the initial sharing of pleasantries and the video wasn't really streaming. So I said, would you mind if I go move on to the telephone? So we they disconnected the video on the telephone, on the speakerphone, both the patient and the family were very clearly able to hear me and we were able to have a, almost like 45 minutes of diagnostic discussion. So it is about, it's not perfect, but at the end, we were able to come to a very good conclusion and they thought, we need to start the father on medication. So it is about com continuing to progress. And other point I would always mention is COVID has been an opportunity and it looks like it has put quality improvement on steroid. So the things we didn't do, we are able to do. The people who would have stopped us doing certain things, they have allowed us. So use this opportunity to do the uh, do the right thing for the patient. And I really feel that our patients are extremely pleased that we are continuing our service. So uh, I'm grateful for Sabrina and team and everybody uh, and who are continuing to do the business as usual in a slightly modified way. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Krish. I'm a very comprehensive talk again. I'm very mindful of time and we've got a lot of questions that have come in um, which we're not going to be able to answer now in the next sort of minute or so. Um, but, but just to note that there were questions about how to work with people, how, how to do baseline physicals and then prescribe. Lots of queries that are coming up. Um, in terms of time, what I'm going to do, I've put a note at the bottom, I'm going to go through some of the comments that we've got and some of the comments from the last time as well, because we might have some of the answers to some of these questions, or at least some of the ideas, and um, perhaps put that into a bit of a summary, either for an MSNAP chat or to kind of come back to it at the start of the next webinar so that we can perhaps answer or at least sort of give some comments on some of the unanswered questions that we have. Um, but so many good talks. Thank you so much. I think that, again, lots of questions about occupational therapy and asking about what tests people are using. And some people are coming back with some really good, clear information about that on the comments as well. So thank you for that. Uh, I think we probably need to end there as we're just before five o'clock. Um, 
thank you so much for joining. I'm not quite sure how many people we've had today. I'm not sure it's quite as many as last time, but it's still well into triple figures. So it's, it's really good to kind of have that, that conversation. And we will be advertising when the next webinar is. And like I say, very much trying to work with all of the memberships, kind of pick up ideas for future conversations. Just a very last comment as it turns five o'clock. Wellbeing has been mentioned a few times, and I think that's something that probably we might need to at least have, have one talk on sometime soon to make sure with all this rapid pace of change that we make sure we look after ourselves so we can do things well. So, so thank you very much and look forward to seeing you again another time.